And as you're making your way to your seats, if you're a guest here with us this morning, thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of our gathering. We trust that uh, you will see in our church a love for God's word and a love for one another. If it's your first time visiting with us, right in front of you on the seat, there's a QR code. And if you take out your phone and act like you're going to take a picture of it, a little link will come up. If you don't mind filling out just that little contact form, it allows us to know that you are here, and it allows us to send you a gift for coming. Uh, We send each person who does the sign-up via QR code a free cup of coffee to Crazy Love Coffee House. And so if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you for being here with us. Well, we've had a lot already going on today. If you didn't know, our new Life Stage classes began today. And uh, you see the classes right up there. There's an adult one, that's the prayer, why, what, and how. Um, Adult two, discipling another believer. Adult three is continuing on in Intro to Bible Doctrines. And this morning in adult four, I taught wisdom from above. Also, Pastor Brian is starting, he started today a brand new series uh, called Lebanon 101 that runs during the 930 hour. And if you are new to our church or you've been coming for a while and you are interested in becoming a member of our gathering, uh, Lebanon 101 is the place where you want to be. It's the first kind of introduction to our church, and it's the first step in the pathway to membership. If you didn't make it today, you can make it next week. Actually, next week we will be all in here together, but the following week. You could just jump right into Lebanon 101 and complete that course with Pastor Brian on Sunday mornings at 9.30. I did mention we have the marriage conference coming up, and the marriage conference is next weekend. The cost is $50 per couple. The guest speaker is Lou Priolo. He's written many books. He's a great biblical counselor, and he's going to be bringing six sessions to strengthen your marriage. Just this past week, I had the opportunity to speak with Lou on the phone, and he mentioned a lot of the uh, courses or the lessons he was going to bring to us, and I'm really, really excited uh, with what he is going to share. Now, the deadline to sign up for the marriage conference is literally today. So you have today to sign up. It's on our website and in the emails we send out. We'll probably take the the sign-up form down tomorrow. So if you really, really want to go, and you don't want to be embarrassed by having to call the church and be like, please, can I come on? Sign up today, okay? And, um, and we'll, get your, we'll get your sign up in there. Um, tonight, after there's a p.m. gathering at 5 p.m., and Pastor Brian and those who went on the Holy Land trip will be showing uh, some of their photos, and Brian will be uh, sharing the spiritual significance of their trip together. And afterwards, um, everybody's invited to go to the Jerusalem Bakery. I believe that's off of Highway 9, right? And it's right across from Pop's Coffee Shop. We'll meet at Jerusalem Bakery after the uh, evening fellowship. Um, pay your own way, but it would be a great way to kind of taste uh, the cuisine of Israel uh, together after hearing from Brian and the crew. Um, members meeting coming up on May 7th. Just mark your calendars for that, members, May 7th in the evening. And then one final announcement just about our Next Steps giving campaign that we kicked off last week. Pastor Brian mentioned we we're kicking off a two-week campaign to see um, if we can re- raise the remaining funds. Um, our projected goal is $1.75 million, and we've raised probably over a million now. And the deadline to let us know what you are going to give would be next Sunday, April 30th. If we could know what you plan to give over the course of the next six months till about October, uh, that would be wonderful as we make plans to start on this building renovation. Guys, we are so close, okay? And we just got to push it over the line, and I think it's going to be wonderful and amazing. Those are all our announcements for today, and now let us turn towards the theme of our gathering and why we are here. We're here because we're justified by faith. Nothing else can make us right before the eyes of God the Father. We are all justified by faith. Even Abraham, we will learn through the call to worship reading in Romans 4, 
Even Abraham was justified by faith. He was a Gentile whom God called out. And because Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. So our call to worship is Romans 4, 22 through chapter 5 and verse 2. It says these words. That is why Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised, uh, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Today we celebrate we are justified by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you a grateful people because from the very beginning of your plan of redemption, you had in mind to redeem all people to yourself not just the Jews, but the world. And you called Abraham out of darkness into your light, and he believed upon you and it was counted to him as righteousness. Lord, thank you that today all who believe on your son are righteous in your sight. And we thank you that you've gathered us together into a new kind of people, Jew and Gentile, that we might sing the praises of you who has loved us and been gracious to us, merciful and kind. And so we pray, Father, that as we sing, that we would sing with sincerity, that we would have hearts that have been reignited by these wonderful truths of being justified by faith. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together and we'll talk, sing of the people of God's faith in Christ, oh how good it is. This world. 
Scriptures make it clear that we are not justified by the works of the law or by our best efforts. We are justified. We're made complete through Jesus Christ together. Let's sing together. Continue singing this grace that started our Christian life is the grace that carries us through. We'll continue singing, yet not I, but through Christ in me. <clears throat> gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold I lay 
Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are Sing, I am free, and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring and all of his work that he accomplished for us, we have got to get his name out. And that's why we as a church uh, have missions. That's why we sponsor so many places to get the word out. And uh, normally once a month, we have what we call a missions moment. One of the ways that we as a church uh, have tried to help get the word of God out. Today, we have a special report for you. Normally once a year, we have what we would call a Gideon report. Many of you are familiar with the work of the Gideons, and today we have the privilege of having Scott Blake, who is the president uh, this year of the Georgia, uh, the Georgia chapter of the Gideons. And uh, he is going to give an update for us of how God is using their work. And so, Scott, you make your way here. He drove all the way up from Savannah this morning. And so thank you for doing that, Scott, and you give us a report. Tell thank us how things are brother. going. Thank you, Brother Brian. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Daddy, Daddy, I got this book from school. Can you, can you read something out of it for me? Little girl in Kudalore, India had just received one of these testaments. Thanks to you, $156 will buy 100 of these little missionaries that went out. One of these went into her hand. But little did she know that when she ran into the kitchen that morning, that her dad was getting ready to do something terrible. He was sitting, getting ready to pour rat poison in the, the curry stew before his family sat down for dinner. And he was going to serve this stew to his family, unbeknownst to them, and commit suicide, mass suicide with his family and murder. Horrible. How sin, how dark and horrible it is. They had, he had prayed to all his Hindu gods to try to better the situation that he had financially. He had borrowed some money to uh, improve his business in India. And uh, you know how that goes, especially in foreign countries, in some third world countries, when you borrow from someone, the interest rates are just amazingly high. He could not make the payments. They came after him. They started threatening him and his family. He didn't know what else to do. So on the way home from work, or on the way home, he went by a pharmacy, got the poison, and there he was, ready to do it. And in runs his, his daughter, Daddy, I got a book I want you to read. Murugan opened the book with tears in his eyes, knowing this is probably the last thing he'll do for his daughter. John chapter 14. If he could have turned anywhere, that was the one to go to. That's the one that I turned to as an atheist drug user back in the 70s. 
on a summer break, John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> I don't know why, but I felt like a boat without a motor, without a compass, and without an anchor. And I read John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I found that all that I was looking for was in a person. And I met him that night. And Muragon opened those pages, John 14, same words. And like a hot potato in his belly, he said, what, what? Who wrote this? What is this? And his wife said, I think that's a Christian book. Why don't you go next door? There's a Christian living next door, and maybe they can tell you what it is and explain it to you. Muragon and his daughter ran next door, and the next-door neighbor, thank you, pastor. Is pastors like you? Apparently, this next-door neighbor was taught how to share the Word of God. And we make it easy, because in the back of the Testament that we give out and that you help pay for, there it is, the plan of salvation. And all that neighbor had to do was just say, would you read that? What do you think of that? Read the next one. What do you think of that? Do you want, do you want to receive Jesus now? And Muragon and his daughter did that moment. Praise God. And, not, and needless to say, God took care of his business. You know, God takes care of those things, right? What's well, the most important thing that happened, though, is their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that whole family was changed. Whole family trees. Tashia in, in Sri Lanka, same thing happened, except in a different way. It happened through her father. Her father was a Buddhist pilot, traveled from many, all over many cities. While in one of the hotel rooms, in his travels, he saw a Bible. He was a Buddhist, firm and fast. His whole family, Buddhist. Tashia said, we were all Buddhists. But my father, as soon as he looked at this Bible that was sitting on the stand, it cost $5 to put that Bible on that stand. Like a Holy Ghost landmine <laughs> all over the world. And here he, he, he comes across this. And as soon as he, he just began to reach for it, he didn't know what it was. He just knew it was, it was a, a book. He probably figured it's something to read. So he started reaching for it, and instantly he hit the ground. He done, they said a force just caused him to go to the ground immediately. And he knew he had to read this book. Tashia said, my whole family tree was changed that night. My father came home, a saved person, a saved a believer in Christ, received that free gift of salvation, born again, a, a sovereign work of God, and now my whole family tree has been changed because of that Bible. Two and a half billion served. No, it's not McDonald's, okay? Two and a half billion scriptures since 1898, actually 1908, when we started distributing these. These were distributed by men and their wives who were businessmen and professionals. Back in 1898, they suffered a lot of temptations. Everybody had to travel. They didn't have Zoom. They didn't have email. So they had to actually go visit their clients, and all this was going on. And they, had, they suffered lots of temptations. So these men got together. And they said, you know, we need to encourage one another. Two men got together in a hotel. They prayed about it. They said, let's have a big meeting. They called 40 or 50 people. Guess how many meetings showed up to that first meeting? Three people. They said, you know, what are we going to call ourselves? Well, since only three of us showed up, I guess 300. Uh, Gideons, how's that? And look at what's happened over 100 years later. And this is a work of God, folks. And God has raised this nation up for such a time as this. Like seeds that God has placed, this living word is a free gift. God's love is being expressed through his church. This is God's love in written form. And you and I are loving the world when we give this word to people. Amen? Amen? And what are we doing? You know, American church, we've been so blessed. Why? So that God could use the many resources he's given to us to put his word in these last days because one day there will be a famine of the word of God but I believe that God is sending out his word now in these times for such a time as this as he said in Psalm 107 he sent his word and he healed them he's healing nations entire nations Zambia a nation used to be in darkness coming out of darkness into the glorious light government officials coming to Christ why because the word of God went forth a man in Zambia said he was going to kill himself, laid on the railroad tracks. 
to kill himself that night. No, the, tra the train didn't come by. He woke up. said, well, I'll try something else. Went to another town. Got into a hotel. Said, I got to kill myself. He lost his job. His family doesn't even know where he's at. He looks over here. He's looking for a rope or a knife or something. What does he see? A Bible. Thanks to you and churches like you, he saw that Bible and he began to open it. Now he is a pastor in Zambia. And the whole nations are being changed. Brothers, I have two. I'm talking about brothers now and your wives. If you're a businessman, a professional, and that, <clears throat> that can be, that's a wide definition on that, okay? I've got two applications here. Are you reaching your Jerusalem, your Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world? I'll tell you, when I became a Gideon 20 years ago, it was like I had been driving a Maserati around in the neighborhood at 35 miles an hour up to this point. But it's when I became a Gideon and I joined with these men from different denominations and walks of life, I then began to, it's like putting the pedal to the metal and finding out what's under the hood. God has anointed us for this work. And men, he's calling you. And I've got applications here. I pray that you will pray. You're, maybe your wife is kicking you right now. You need to be a member. Come on. We're the Gideons in this place. You can notice we're gray-headed. If, if there's someone gray-headed in here, they're probably a Gideon. It's, it's, it's a shame. It is a shame. This is a powerful ministry God has raised up. But the average age of the Gideon in Georgia is 68. And that, that should not be. Men, we need you. You need to take, you need to obey God. It's not that we don't, this is God's work. But we need to obey him, amen? Pastor, thank you so much. You're a giving church. You've given over 100 boxes a year of these testaments, every year. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for all that you've allowed us to do. God bless you. Bless you, my brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Well, this morning, uh, let me invite you. Uh, every year, you have a, and thank you for, just a reminder of the power of the gospel, the power of God's word. And uh, if you want to give particularly to this endeavor, uh, this is a special day. You want to designate that. These, uh, we have our two offering boxes, the one on the side and one in the uh, back. Of course, you've probably already seen. You can choose to give online as well. There'll, there'll be a way that you can select Gideon's International and so let me encourage you to pray through that and see how you can give in this particular endeavor. And uh, encourage you after the service to uh, introduce yourself to Scott. And, uh, of course, and all the other Gideons who are here, if you have any questions about that, we have numbers of them in our church. And uh, trust it will be a blessing to you. Join me as I pray. Father, I want to thank you that you gave us both the written word and the inscripturated, authenticated, and human word, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was the word made flesh. Lord, we thank you that he came and died for us and resurrected and gave us purpose in life. And Lord, now help us to be a church to spread the word to the world. I do ask particularly today that you would continue to bless the work of the Gideons as they seek to spread the word in Georgia and all across this world. Be with their next few distributions. I ask that you would allow similar situations as that man in India. Would you allow people to be drawn to you through the scripture? Lord, today, would you allow your word to have deep root in our lives as we in just a moment allow it to be opened before us. Guide us, I pray, in the rest of our worship service. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and we'll continue singing His Robes for Mine. robes for mine, no oh, wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his 
His righteousness I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place He died. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. I stand with righteous words of mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cross. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not. is a peace. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, and right is done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. can do as people, as believers, is to look to Christ and to see in him the one who meets all of our needs. Let's sing together, turn your eyes upon Jesus.
through the second grade out the back doors you can be seated parents if you're new to our gathering the teacher will meet them out there in the hallway and you can pick them up right down this hallway at the conclusion of our gathering thank you this morning let me invite you to turn in your bibles to romans 4 we are going to be investigating a few verses in this particular chapter of the sacred scriptures why you turn there, let me exhort everybody in this room in reference to next weekend. Okay. If you're a married couple, particularly, if you haven't signed up for the marriage conference, let me implore you, uh, between 9 and basically 2 o'clock, could you give us those hours for us as a church to help you grow in your marriage. I don't know if you can move things around. Maybe your schedule's already full at that time. But as a pastor, I'm asking that you would check it and see if you can change things to be a part of it. That means you're going to have to do something today, which means this, sign up, okay? If you are here and maybe you're unmarried, um, of course, we're inviting anyone to be a part of this conference, particularly I know there's uh, engaged couples, uh, those who are just investigating marriage. Uh, if you are, if you're, maybe your spouse is out of town or something like that, let me ask some of you, would you be willing to invest in your church congregation? Maybe you could help in the nursery. Maybe you could help in children's church as uh, uh, we do some special things for our kids that day. I would love for all of you to come. So take it as an exhortation from your pastor. Can you make this happen? And I tell you, you will be thankful you did. If you're married, all of us need investment in that area. Okay? And so here is an easy way of doing it. So sign up today, and I'll leave it at that. All right. Romans chapter 4. I'm going to read a few verses here and then pray and ask God for divine help for all of us to understand 
what those verses say. So listen to what it says. Romans 4, I'll begin reading in verse number 9. It says this. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he was circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him as well the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Can you understand why we need help today? Okay. We need divine enablement. Maybe you're here visiting today. You're like, what are you going to be talking about today? Well, it's exciting because it's in the word of God. And so would you join me as I lead us in prayer? Father, today we need your spirit to enlighten our minds and then prick our hearts. We need spiritual work to be done And we know that whenever your word is presented, it will not return void. And so today, I ask that it would be like the hammer that breaks the rock. That it would be like the sword that cuts asunder and and, and shows the thoughts and intents of the heart. That it would be like a fire. And that you would use your word to change us to be more like you. Father, help us today as we hear from it. In Jesus' name, amen. As you heard at the beginning of our service tonight, I'm going to share a little bit about our Holy Land trip that I just returned from just a few weeks ago. Someone made the comment while we were on the trip that they found it interesting. I can't remember if they said interesting or entertaining, okay, watching me handle everything that came at me during the tour. One of the things they particularly noticed was all the questions that I was asked. Okay, Any of you who have ever led an event or a tour will know that you will face tons of questions. Those of you who have done family trips with your kids, you know you are in, in store for lots of different questions. When are we going to get there? When are we going to stop? All the questions, they just add up. Those of you who are parents, you learn to navigate lots of questions when your children are able to begin to talk. Once your child starts school, they too learn how to navigate questions in order to test their knowledge. All of life is filled with questions. Questions are good. Why? Because questions hopefully lead us to truth, bring us to answers. What was the last question that you were asked? The one I just asked you, okay? You're asked questions all the time, okay? As you consider all the questions that you face in life, The most important questions in life actually concern your death. How do you prepare for death? Because it's coming. How do you answer the questions, those questions about death are absolutely critical for all eternity? Of course, when it comes to death, we're often offered remedies to deal with death. Things that try to, you could say, postpone death. And hey, this is how you prepare for it. Just like today, you're going to be offered numbers of different options 
for lunch on your way home. You'll see on signs, Whoppers on sale. Some of you are not going to be tempted by that, okay? You'll have lots of advertisements. Hey, eat here, eat here. When it comes to death, you are offered all the time answers or remedies or uh, ways to deal with that looming question of life. Romans, this letter that we have been exploring over the last now 15 weeks, Romans is a letter that deals with that very important question of how we escape life. I mean, how do we escape death at the end of our lives here? And it provides for us the only way of escape, the only way of rescue, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The way that God chose to allow humanity to be rescued. Why? Because all of us, every one of us is under God's wrath, but God in his grace provided what I would often refer to as an alien righteousness. A righteousness that is out of this world, something that none of us could provide. And that righteousness is found through faith in Jesus Christ. It is nothing that you can provide in and of yourselves. It is not of works as we learned last week. As we began to explore Romans 4 last week, we looked in Romans 4 verses 1 through 8. And what Paul did was he brought kind of the premier guide to the stand to prove to you that salvation is not your own doing. It is the result of grace through faith. The guy he brought to the stand was none other than Abraham. And in those first eight verses, he reiterates to us how a person is saved. Our text today builds on that. He will reiterate some of those things, but he doesn't answer how. Today he answers who can be saved. Now remember, Paul is writing to a local church just like us that was in the city of Rome 2,000 years ago. It was a church that was predominantly Gentile, which meant non-Jews. It had numbers of Jews, and one of the people, one of the Jews who wasn't there at that time, he was writing to them was Paul. He was a Jew. He was steeped at one time in Judaism. He had the marks of being a Jew. He had been circumcised. He was one who for years followed, in some ways to the T, like a Pharisee, the Mosaic law. But the lurking question for these Romans as they read this letter was this. Is salvation, this beautiful gospel that he's provided, is salvation only for those who become Jewish or Jews? Do I need to become and succumb to all of those particular regulations, rules, or is this blessing that Paul talked about at the beginning of chapter 4, is this blessing of salvation and forgiveness for anybody? Or is it just reserved for those who are practicing Jews? Now, most of you who came into church today did not come with that pressing question on your mind. That was not like, oh, I wonder if he's going to answer that question today. Okay. But maybe your question is similar. Is this salvation by faith in Jesus Christ open to anybody? period. Is it simply faith in Jesus Christ and you're done? Can I be blessed too? Can anybody be blessed? Today we will begin to find the answers with questions. Paul asked a number of questions. In fact, what I'm going to uncover for you today is this. We're going to see three questions, but they're all kind of one question. And then we're going to see a definitive answer. So today, to start with, is this. Can I be blessed too? 
you who are Gentiles, can you be blessed too? Well, three questions really to ask a big question. Paul opens with three questions that kind of build on each other. Look at it, it says in verse number nine. It says this, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Now, that question is the big question. I would say the main question. Notice he says, is this blessing? What is he talking about this blessing? What's going on here that he says, is this blessing for not simply the circumcised, but for the uncircumcised? Well, the blessing that he's talking about has been already referred to at the beginning of chapter 4. And the blessing is this. Can you and me, could we receive God's righteousness by faith, that blessing, and then notice what it says a few verses earlier in verse 6. It says this. Just as David also speaks of the what? The blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Can you and I have the blessing of having God's credited righteousness to us by faith and to have the blessing of total forgiveness of our sins? Can I have this? Or is it only for the, you could say, the circumcised? Illustrate it this way. Let's say that Pastor Mark was throwing a big cookout okay, at his house. And you hear that the staff is going to the cookout. And you want to come. You want to be there. You want to be a part. And so you're asking yourself, can I come too? Can I be a part? Who's invited? Is it just the staff? Do you have to be kind of on paid staff to do this? Can anyone share in the blessing of Mark's grilling? Can anyone play on his grass that he's so excited about in his front yard right now? Or do I need to be on paid staff? To go to, the, go to the party. Do I need to be able to sing on tune? Will he check me? Do you have to be able to sing to be a part of the cookout? Do I have to bring something with me? I mean, is it required that you bring dessert? Like Baptists, they always have to bring something. Okay? What's being asked is this. This incredible blessing of coming into God's family and having salvation by faith, is it simply for people who do certain things, that brings up this question of circumcision, okay? First of all, for half the people in this room, okay, this is not an option for you, okay? Circumcision was a definitive sign for male Jews who particularly were following the Mosaic law. Okay, now let me, let me help you with this. The Mosaic law was given to Israel, I believe, around 1446 B.C. And it was given to Israel as a nation to uh, help them to be a light to the world, help to protect them from, you could say, being caught into all the sins of the world at that time, and to help them to be in... To, to begin to be a light to the world. So from 1446 B.C. until Jesus came and you could say fulfilled the law. Part of the Mosaic law was this idea of circumcision. However, circumcision predated the Mosaic law by 500 years. So 500 years before that, to the time of Abraham... If you wanted to be a part of the Jewish community or you were a son of Abraham, you needed this identifier of being circumcised. It was kind of the litmus test. What Paul is asking here in verse 9 was this. Paul is asking whether this sign 
circumcision. However, I think he's spreading it out broadly. He says, circumcision was just the clear visible sign, but I think he's kind of uh, talking about broadly the entire Mosaic law observance. Is this essential for salvation? Do I need to believe in faith in Christ and then do I need to start law keeping because he's writing to this group of people who were in what? Rome. Did they need to become Jewish? Did they need to succumb and follow in this? Paul is again asking, okay, in this, he's going back to what he's already addressed in the first eight verses. He's asking again about the necessity of works. Do I need to do these things? What's essential? Okay, so as soon as he asks that question, he answers it. Look what he says at the end of verse 9. For if Abraham was justified, and that word justified is this, if he was given God's righteousness at a very precise moment in time, and he was given righteousness, if he was justified by, oh, excuse me, uh, I'm reading, that was in verse 2. Okay, he says this at the end of verse uh, 9. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as what? Righteousness. He received God's credited righteousness and was forgiven of all of his sin by what? By faith. That's how he received righteousness. So Paul is here. As soon as he asks the question, can anyone be blessed? He says, let me remind you, it's faith by which Abraham got justified. But Paul then goes and proves his point with two follow-up questions. Look what he says now in verse 10. He says this, how then was it counted to him? Okay, question. And then he says this, was it before or after he was circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. And basically Paul says, okay, hey, you want, an an you want the answer to this question? Let's look at the timetable. Now, all of us have seen probably or watched court cases, and they got solved simply by looking at the facts of the timetable. That person couldn't have done it because they're on video over here, and you just look at the timetable. Well, that's what Paul's doing here. He says, just look at the timetable. How was Abraham given righteousness? Was it before he was circumcised or after? Was, was that required? And he's basically saying, er, look at the facts. Okay, all of you in this room, as you and I become more and more aware and we hear these truths that are in Romans 1, 2, and 3, once you begin to understand that salvation is by grace through faith alone, there are numbers of objections that you bring up yourself. And you're like, is it really that? Is that really that's all that's needed? Do I need to do these other things in order to have my sins forgiven? What do I need to bring to the party? I mean, when I get to heaven, do I need to have like a casserole? Okay. Do I need to have some cheesecake or something like that? Do I need to have like hey, I went to church 50% of the time. Okay. Are you sure he's going to let you in? I mean, you always hear the joke of Peter at the gate. Can my kids come with me? I got a lot of them. Can they come too? Do I need church clothes? I mean, is it, what do I have to wear? Am I going to stick out like a sore thumb when I get there? Did the Romans need to submit to the Mosaic law or was it faith alone? Who could come to the party? Honestly, this blessing of forgiveness, okay, 
If really, if you need forgiveness and you need the righteousness of God in order to get to heaven, you better check this, okay? This is not something that you want to be mixed up about when you get to heaven. This is not something that you want to be iffy on. You know what? A similar question happened in the history of the church in Acts chapter 15. Okay, I'm not going to take you there, but let me just tell you. Do you remember Jesus resurrected okay, at the end of the Gospels? He appeared, and you can read about his appearing at the beginning of Acts. And then the gospel goes primarily to what group of people initially? The Jews. However, God and his providence did not, it wasn't just for the Jews, it was for all. And there was a very prominent event that happened in Acts chapter 10, where a guy by the name of Cornelius, who was a clear Gentile, God was drawing to himself. He needed to hear the word, and so he used Peter to come to deliver the word. And here was a guy who had not been observing the Mosaic law. And God has to tell Peter repeatedly, what I have made clean, do not call unclean. And there were all these dietary laws that Peter thought he had to at least continue to subscribe to. And God was just making it clear, and really the whole story of Acts chapter 10 and 11 is how the gospel is open to the Gentiles, and how are they saved? It's by faith in Christ. But then when you get to Acts chapter 15, there was a church, kind of like Lebanon, that got started in Antioch, okay? It got started in Antioch, and there were people who started coming in and saying, hey, faith in Christ, but you know what? you got to be circumcised. you got to start following the law. And so Paul heads back down, and they have this big conference in, uh, they call it the Jerusalem Council. And what was solved at the Jerusalem Council was this. Did Gentiles need to observe all of these laws? And the answer was this, no. However, he did say, Because all of these Jews and Gentiles are getting together and because Moses is preached all across the world, this is going to be a very difficult transition. So I'm going to ask that the Gentiles observe a few of these things. For And basically, some of them were clear that we need to continue to do. But he says, can they do these as this group is coming together? But this was the answer here. So in these questions, we have a reminder of the former answer. Okay, when when Paul says this, can anybody be blessed? Is it just for the uncircumcised or is uh, is it just for the circumcised or is it for the uncircumcised? His answer, first of all, is this. I want to reiterate to you, it's by faith uh, alone. That's how Abraham got saved. But now he goes on and takes a step further on who can be saved. And listen to what my second point is this. So if I'm asking this question, can I be blessed too? Here's the answer. Yes. You can follow in the faith of Abraham. You can. In fact, Paul now proves his point with a kind of full answer. Notice first, he asks them to visit the timeline again. Look what it says in verse 10. Uh, It says, how then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he was circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. And now he elaborates on it. He says in verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had, how? By faith, while he was still uncircumcised. So he's basically saying this. Okay, all of you are wondering by what basis he gives righteousness. Let me just make it very clear to you. It's not by him being circumcised and following the law. He got saved a long time before he was circumcised. In fact, if you look at Abraham's timetable, he received the crediting of God's righteousness in Genesis 15. And how does he get it? He gets it by faith. He is circumcised at the end 
of chapter 17. How many years were in between? Well, some rabbis say it was 29 years. It's at least, I think, 13 years. But it was numbers of years later that he submits to this circumcision that God wanted for his people. So he proves that faith is the means of receiving God's righteousness. And as a reminder to you, if you're going to get saved... It is nothing that you bring to the table. Faith is the ground. Okay, faith in Christ's work will be the ground that anyone gets saved in. I think I've explained this to you. Imagine that uh, this podium stood for Christ on the cross. Okay, and imagine everybody over here, these are all the Old Testament people, people who live from Adam until Jesus. Everybody has always been saved by grace. They didn't deserve it. Through faith, they looked, they heard the word, and they had to believe it. The ground of it was Christ, what he would do. They looked forward to him. Now, how much information did they have? There's a lot of times questioned, how much information? Well, it's interesting. Did you know Job? who lived, we believe, even before Abraham, said this, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at a latter day upon this earth. And though after my death worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see and not another, how my heart yearns for that day. So they knew a lot more than you and I give them credit to. And then you and I, who live in 2023, We are also saved by grace. We don't deserve it. Through faith in what God said, his word. But there's a lot more information than that we have learned about it. In fact, the Bible says, neither is salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men whereby a person can be saved. It's only through Jesus. If you are here today and you think you can get to God, all different sides of the mountain, you say, oh, Islam, they're going to come up this way, and Hindus are going to come up, and we're all going to end up finding God in our own manner, that is a lie from the pit of hell. The true story is not that we all climb up the mountain different ways and we're all going to find God. The truth of the story is that God who was on the top of the mountain came down from his mountain in the person of Jesus Christ and died for you and there is only salvation in Jesus and him alone. And you have to believe in him. So, was, what was circumcision then for? Why in the world did he institute this? Why was this, I mean, this was confusing. Now notice what it says in the text. Look what it says in verse, again, verse 11. Abraham, or that's he, he received the sign of circumcision, that physical sign, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So notice the word, it was a sign and it was a seal. It was a physical sign. And it was to remind him of him being a part of God's covenant. God had selected a group of people who ultimately would be, you could say, the nursery You and I set aside sometimes a certain room in our house that will be the nursery by which ultimately our kid will grow and develop. God chose a people, a clan, and it was the Jewish nation to be the nursery from which Messiah would come. And he gave them certain requirements for a certain amount of time. But that physical act was there to be a physical reminder of him setting them apart. Notice it's interesting, when Paul talks about it, he says this, he received the sign of circumcision. It's interesting that he, he focuses on not the point of he does it, but that he receives it. Not him accomplishing it, but that it was almost like something that he accepted from somebody else. God said, this is what I want you to do. And it was going to be a seal to authenticate something. And the idea is like in in ancient times, seals were often used to authenticate something like uh, 
Uh, I'll probably maybe even share something tonight about things that they've discovered. Bulas, which were like seals that they would put on ancient uh, scrolls that would authenticate the scroll, that it was something from certain people. Well, basically God said, Abraham, he was saved by faith, by grace through faith. Years later, I gave him a sign to, to be assigned to the world and also to authenticate the truth to him of what I was doing with that particular group. It's almost like uh, uh, when I traveled out of the country, I have to provide, a, you could say, a seal of my citizenship. That's my passport. That this is kind of a seal to prove that I can get back in. It was kind of a seal to him of this commitment that he's made in his life. The physical act of circumcision was simply a sign in a seal of the faith that Abraham exercised. They were important for him to do because they showed obedience that was rooted in his faith. But notice, what Paul does now is he doesn't stop there. He has a purpose in all this. Notice what it says now in verse, at the end of verse 11. The purpose was to make him, Abraham, the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. Now, why did he plan it in the timetable he did? He wanted to be very clear to everybody. It was first to show that anyone, if they are uncircumcised and were not given the Mosaic law, Anyone who follows in Abraham's faith can be blessed. And I love this. It's interesting. Who does he focus on first? He focuses on the Gentiles. That's special. He says, all of you, you can be, you can come and be a child of God by following in the faith of Abraham without being circumcised. But then in, at the, in verse 12, he includes those who were circumcised. He says, and to make him the father of the circumcised. And then he adds this little caveat, who are not merely circumcised, but who walk also in the faith or walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was uncircumcised or excuse me, before he was circumcised. So he now includes the Jews as well, but he stresses that it was for them by faith, not physical circumcision. Paul has already said earlier in this letter that it's a spiritual circumcision that's important. In fact, he says in chapter 2, let me just read it to you, verse 28 and 29, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Okay, I feel like I'm climbing up a hill uh, trying to explain this. But what this whole text is saying is this. Abraham is to be, and he can be, the father of everybody, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. You have to follow in the faith of Abraham. It is not simply for for those who are physically circumcised. This is to show that all people of faith must follow in the footsteps of Abraham who believed God. All of us can be saved by faith. And what he's going to do, and and I have to realize that I got the whole rest of Romans to continue to explain this, but what does this mean for you and me, okay? And here's where we'll just close it out. Everybody in this room, you can and you must walk in the footsteps of Abraham's faith. You have to believe in God and his word, what he says, what he's promised, You believe in it. What has he revealed up to 2023? Believe it. By faith. 
become a follower of Jesus. Do you believe, so if you're here in this room, do you believe that Jesus is God's final word? I mean, you think of Hebrews 1, God who in sundry times and in various ways spoke in times past by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us through his what? Through his son. Who was his son? It was Jesus. When God chose to send a forerunner before Jesus, he sent a man by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was just a few months older than Jesus, began to speak in the wilderness, reminding everybody, you are all sinners, and unless you repent, you will perish. And here were a bunch of people who began to say, yes, I am a sinner. And he says, now to symbolize that you are repentant, I want you to uh, succumb, or you could say submit to the rite of baptism by repentance. And it was, a, it was a beautiful picture of, I don't want my sin anymore. But John the Baptist didn't stop there. He says, I baptize you, but there is one who's coming, whose sandal I am not willing to unloose. He will baptize you with the what? The Spirit and the power. I want you to look for him. And then it was not much longer he shows up. And you remember what John the Baptist says? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Here he is. A little bit later, Jesus now has been uncovering to the world who he is, and he feeds the 5,000 with the loaves and the fish. And all the people are like, we want to do these works. Man, if we could be a breadbasket, if we could help do this, how do we work those works? And you remember what Jesus says to them? Listen to what he says. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. And he, no doubt, maybe he pointed to himself at that point. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And that's what we often do. How can I, what do I need to do? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered, this is not your work. This is the work of who? God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You've got to believe in Jesus. That is the ground of your salvation. So if you're here today and you have never placed your faith in God's son, believe in him. But let me take it one step further. What is now the sign of the new covenant? If that was the old covenant, What's the sign of the new covenant? Does that mean, okay, do I need to get that bumper sticker? I've seen that fish bumper sticker. And do I need to get the fish bumper sticker? Is that the sign to let everybody know in the neighborhood? Now, that could be a bad testimony for the church because I've seen how some of you drive. I know how I drive, okay? That should not be the sign of the covenant, okay? Is it a tattoo? Do I need to get the cross tattoo? Even maybe a small one, big one, is that, is that the sign of the covenant? Do I need to have a necklace? A necklace, is that the sign that I am a follower of Jesus? Well, in fact, you know what he says is the sign? Now, it, it's baptism. You let people know, like, circumcision was a sign of the old covenant for those who were a part of that. Baptism is a sign of the new, Okay. It's not the means of your salvation. If you're depending, I got baptized when I was sprinkled, when I was one, or I did this. If you're depending on your work, you are in trouble because your work's not going to give you one day in heaven. It's only Jesus' finished work. But he has said if you have believed in him, you display that you are a follower of his by submitting to baptism. It's not the means of salvation, but he has said this is what you're supposed to do. And if you and, and there are people who are peddling the truth that you need to believe, and then you also have to be baptized to be saved. And that's adding to salvation. Okay. It's wrong. It's not for salvation, but it is for obedience. You want to obey him. But 
You may, if you're here today and you've never submitted to believer's baptism, you may want to authenticate your faith with that step, like Abraham did by submitting to God for the old covenant, you could say. But you know what I think is one of the most clear demonstrations that you and I, it's a sign. Baptism is kind of a visual sign, but most of us probably didn't see each other get baptized unless you kind of grew up here or been here for a little bit of time. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you do what? You love the brothers. One way that you can show this every day of your life is you can love the brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, who are they? Well, they're right here. Are you displaying your faith through your works? In fact, in Galatians it says, For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail anything, but faith that works through what? Love. You display it by loving. How much have you loved the brothers? How much are you investing in you and how much are you investing in the body? You ought to look for more ways to invest in the way that we advertise to this community that we are people of faith is we we do it through baptism initially, but then we do it through loving the brothers. And then what's the seal of this that kind of is like the seal for us that we are followers of God? Well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is now the seal for us that we are his followers. In fact, listen to what he says in Ephesians 4. He says this, in whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, okay, for some of you that was when you were eight years old, and you held off on getting saved until you were 14, but then you believed in it, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, and what happened? You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The moment you got saved, what happened is he authenticated and sealed it by depositing into your life God himself, the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. You now have the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And you know what that Holy Spirit is doing? He is every day using all the situations in life as you submit to that Spirit to produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control. You, I mean, you can just go through the list. And you know what helps to authenticate it to you? It's the Spirit of God who lives in you. He's pushing you always to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And let me say, if you don't have that seal and you don't sense the Spirit who is convicting you and then you better check, have I actually believed in Christ? Because he is the seal of the salvation that you have. So, we end with this. Who is this available to? Every single one of you. All of you can go by Father Abraham's way, by faith in God's word. And his word is none other than his son, Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, and I'll end with this. If he can be, if anyone can be saved, that means, guess what? Everybody in your neighborhood has a target on them. (laughs) Share it. I mean, when's the last time you shared? I mean, I was thinking about that for myself. I want to be better at just sharing the message of Jesus. Because can anyone have this blessing? Yes, if we just follow Father Abraham. But more importantly, Father Abraham says you need to follow who? God. And God pointed you to his what? His son, who did everything for your salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of this text. We thank you that we, again, got to chew on and meditate on and swim in the gospel. And Lord, may it be an incredibly sanctifying thing. And Lord, would you take the truths of this text and would you help us not simply to be hearers of your word, but help us to be doers of it as well. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you want to begin a life with Jesus Christ, 
let me invite you to find somebody and say, how can I start this? You've got a lot of people here. You've got a lot of Jesus followers here. Talk to someone today. I will try to, as soon as I'm done praying, make a beeline to the back door. Okay, if you want to talk to me, I'll be there. If you're visiting today, okay, I would love to meet you if you have an extra minute or two and you can uh, stop by and introduce yourself. I'd love to uh, meet you. And so I'll be at the back door. And uh, one final thing, uh, I told you last week, we have two weeks of a special campaign that we're asking that you would make a commitment to. I hope that you are praying about that. Okay, I've asked you to. Okay, pray. What can you do to be a part of this next renovation? And I don't want you to make the decision yourself. I want you to ask God to help you make that decision. And we'll see what God's going to do in reference to that. So let me ask you to do that and give to the Gideons. What a great opportunity this morning that you heard about. All right, join me as I close our service in prayer. Father, Lord, as we depart from here, Lord, I ask that you would protect us this afternoon. I ask that we would be people that authenticate our faith through our lives, that we would show love to the brothers. For those of us who come back tonight for our special time together, would you bless that? Would you use even that to encourage us in our faith? And then, Lord, would you further your work all across this world? Lord, would you allow many more people, as we heard about during the Gideon presentation, would you help them to hear this message of the word And Father, may they be converted. Lord, help us to do our part to this end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week.